that everything should be set up and ready to go. <clears throat> so let's do this. Maybe. Hello, welcome to an adventure. How is everybody today? I hope that you are having a good week so far. Um, I hope that the audio levels are good today. <laughs> I know there were some issues last week, uh, so do let me know if those for some reason have recurred. Um, <clears throat> also, you might notice that my voice is a little bit wobbly today. I had issues this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I had a coughing fit triggered and uh, coughed a lot this morning and it sort of wore out my voice. Uh, it's okay. Um, we'll get through this and <sighs> it's no worse than it was <clears throat> while back. So anyway, uh, hi, Lord Portico. It is good to see you. Hi, Hannah. It is good to see you as well. Um, welcome to anybody else who just has not uh, said hi. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, I am uh, Rogan27, also known as Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. And this is a stream I do once a week, uh, shared between my Twitch channel and the library's Twitch channel. Uh, so you can watch either on um, twitch.tv slash btul studios or twitch.tv slash rogan27. <clears throat> uh, and what we do is we take a look at some items from the archives and just see what we can learn. Um, I'm, I like the spooky music. It's very um, appropriate for this time of year. However, I'm going to switch us, I think, because of what we're looking at today, to some folk music. Uh, also, I did not need um, random screaming from the music, but it was appropriate because I was playing the spooky channel. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, we should probably start looking at what we're doing today. Um, before we dive into the specific archival things that will be featured, since the materials we'll be looking will <clears throat> the materials we will be looking at uh, are owned by Virginia Tech's Special Collections and University Archives. Um, and this is all about history. It's important to keep in mind the history of Virginia Tech. Uh, and so <clears throat> at the start of the show, we just want to acknowledge, uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Mon Monacan people's homeland, uh, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. <clears throat> we further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in California and other areas in the West. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Enslaved Black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on the construction of its building. <clears throat> so we just want to keep that in mind as, as we look at history, because it's important to remember our history. So, <clears throat> what are we looking at today? Well, Today we are looking at a newspaper called the West Virginia Hillbilly. <clears throat> you may have noticed that the um, <clears throat> stream title has an asterisk in it. That's because uh, when I tried to put in the title, 
and say what the name of the stream was. Twitch said, this might be against uh, moderator's restrictions. And it wouldn't let me use the title. Um, <clears throat> for some reason. Probably because it is often used in a derogatory way. Um, Twitch would not let me use the word hillbilly in the title or the stream announcement. So, <clears throat> while it is the title of the newspaper that we are going to be looking at, um, I could not include it in the title of the stream. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we're going to be looking at the West Virginia hillbilly. I have pulled up here, this is the, um, the West Virginia Encyclopedia online. Um, I made it extra big. Like, that's... Yeah, it looked like that originally. So I just zoomed in for us. Um, <clears throat> the West Virginia hillbilly... Uh, I found this stuff because... <clears throat> I was looking for something and was walking through looking at all of the boxes on the shelves because we were trying to find something that was um, uh, misplaced. And I saw four boxes sitting there that said West Virginia Hillbilly. And I was like, I'm curious. And so I made a note of it <clears throat> and, and was like, okay. I'm going to go get those boxes and see, is it something that I could use for the show? Uh, so this was entirely just, I saw the title on a box label and was like, I wonder what that is. Hmm. So what it is, is uh, the West Virginia Hillbilly is a weekly newspaper. Um, and you'll note here, apparently uh, they spelled it W-E-A-K-L-Y on their masthead. <clears throat> it was started in Richwood in 1957 by Jim Comstock. So we'll probably want to take a look and see who Jim Comstock was. Um, in its heyday, the newspaper had circulation of 20,000 to 30,000 people, or addresses at least, <clears throat> in 40... U.S. states, and six foreign countries. Uh, Comstock also published the Richwood, Richwood News Leader, established after he returned from World War II, and owned jointly with Bronson McClung. Let's see, okay. So while Comstock was the editor, the hillbilly remained popular, apparently widely popular, <clears throat> with West Virginia residents and native West Virginians living elsewhere. Uh, so, it being called the West Virginia Hillbilly is not uh, in and of itself making fun of West Virginians, um, at, or at least th they were in on the joke. They enjoyed the newspaper, apparently. <clears throat> a typical issue included feature articles, columns of interest, book notes, never quite enough ads to make the publication truly pop, uh, profitable. <laughs> that's, I love, I love the way that's phrased. And never quite enough ads to make it profitable, which is why it's no longer in publication. <clears throat> The most read and usually best written was the Comstock load. So we'll want to look for that uh, when we look at some issues. Famous for its occasional practical jokes. Once including the release of a mountain lion to trick a neighboring editor as to whether the animal was extinct in West Virginia. Curmudgeonly humorous throughout, the West Virginia hillbilly <clears throat> conveyed Comstock's conservative politics in a good-natured way. Uh, the paper and its editor fed each other's notoriety, making Jim Comstock for many years one of the most sought-after speakers in West Virginia. So, okay, he tried to sell it. 
as early as 76. Uh, in 81, he sold it to the South Charleston Publishing Company. <clears throat> He came out of retirement in 1986 on his 75th birthday to repurchase the paper. And then he sold it to Sandy McCauley in 92, and they stopped publishing in 2001. I had never heard of it. And I, I mean, I grew up in Virginia. I started undergrad within... I was like a 10 minute drive or so to West Virginia. I here, we're also not that far from West Virginia. I had never heard of this paper. Um, <clears throat> so let's see who this Jim Comstock person was. Born in Richwood, son of Harry Clinton Comstock and Myrtle Blanche Cunningham Comstock. Went to Marshall College and, and graduated in 34. Uh, then he was a teacher at Richwood High School until early World War II. <clears throat> and then he went and worked for a defense plant before serving in the US Navy for the latter part of World War II. Then he returned home, founded the Richwood, Richwood News Leader, and was its editor. And then in 57, he founded the Hillbilly. He also did, he published a West Virginia heritage encyclopedia titled Pa and Ma and Mr. Kennedy. and a collection titled Best of Hillbilly. Okay. He operated a bookstore adjacent to the newspaper office. Started Mountain State Press. Ran for Congress in 63, but lost. <clears throat> Founded the University of Hard Knocks to recognize the accomplishments of successful individuals who never attended college. Okay. Uh, honorary society conceived by him serves in a lighthearted way to recognize people who succeed in life without the benefit of a college degree. Has its own seal which includes a motto in Latin that translates to blood, sweat, and tears. The official colors are black and blue. I think I'm getting uh, a sense of his sense of humor. <clears throat> All right. Well, how about we look at the newspaper itself? I have issues from the 1960s, I, I believe. So... The West Virginia Hillbilly. <clears throat> it looks like the earliest stuff that we have is from 1961. What is going on with the music? It's supposed to only play instrumental, and it sure sounds like lyrics to me. Anyway, um, okay. The West Virginia Hillbilly. It was 10 cents in 1961, 1962. Sorry, this is an issue from June of 1962, it looks like. Spokesman for the state that has prosperous panhandlers. So, I, 
I know because I used this image for the promotional stuff um, that that is a, it, it's inspired by the West Virginia State Seal. All right. If anybody has any specific dates that they would like me to see if we have an issue for, um, I am definitely open to that because right now, I don't know. Um, Night of the Saddle Pockets. Oh, it looks like it's a It says chapter seven, fact and fancy. There are wild winds shaking in a storm that's <laughs> Yeah, it looks like it's a it's an ongoing story. Um <laughs> okay, we've got a page, so page three here is entirely focused on the 1860s, the week of June 1st to June 7th, 1862, Civil War in the Hills. The story of the American Civil War in the West Virginia Hills told week by week as it happened a hundred years before, all in newspaper style. What is the... I don't understand what's going on with the music. It's supposed to be doing acoustic only. It definitely is not doing that. I just gonna reset and tell it again. Instrumental only, please. Um, I don't know. See how this goes. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I want to start. I think I'm. I'm just getting a sense of what's here first. I'm thinking I definitely want to look at the the Comstock load thing. Uh, there's a whole whole bit here about snakes in church. Um, mountain exploration, page for lovers of the outdoors, the shocking death of deer by cars. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to look at this one because I have a feeling it's, um, uh, going to be an example of the dry wit. By Jerry uh, Chiapetta. Oh, gosh. It's a fake name. Chiapetta. In Dodge News. A drive in America's North Country can be a refreshing thing with nature's panorama unfolding before the windshield of your car, your giant screen through which you view the country. But there is a hazard engineers can't fence out, a hazard lawmakers can't legislate against, a hazard that can ruin your motor trip, maybe even you and your family. This is the hazardous game of 
dodging deer, and other big game that gets worse with each new driver, with each new mile of high-speed superhighways. <clears throat> Actually, hitting deer is one of this nation's most startling, unpublicized motoring problems today, as we discovered during a five-month, 50-state survey of this highway headache. We learned, for the first time, that in 1960, 113 deer and other large animals were killed on our highways every single day in the year, or 41,311 for the year by actual count. One of the many wildlife experts we interviewed for this exclusive study said that for every single big game animal reported as, quote, known killed on the roads, there must be at least 50 others hit or causing accidents that are never reported to us. If this specialist is anywhere near correct, and I believe he is, this means that there are more than 2 million animal-caused mishaps every year in the USA. Our study was concerned with big game animals only because no state ever attempted to keep records on the millions of rabbits, pheasants, and other small creatures which are killed each year or cause motorists headaches and nervous moments on the roads. Oh dear. That pun was unintended. Hmm. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Reader writes. So those are letters to the editor. Save the covered bridge. I want to see. Surely men can live together. June 2nd of 1962. I'm curious about what this article is going to be about. Taking their cue from the four chaplains who knew how to die together, this Charleston group called the Six Laymen dedicate themselves to new Americans and to the proposition that people can live together. Out of the chilly depths of the North Atlantic, where where four men, all chaplains, joined hands and went down with their torpedoed ship that others might live and fight for a cause, came forth a great truth. If men must die together, surely men can live together. And out of that truth, in keeping with those words, in our time and in our state, has developed an organization called the Six Laymen, de dedicated to the cause of making the way easier for people who have not only chosen America as their new nation, but have cast their lot with us in West Virginia. We call them New Americans. <clears throat> One of these six said to me recently, we are having a little dinner at the Daniel Boone and we'd like for you to come and maybe write about it. You'll get a formal invitation, but I just wanted to invite you personally. The man is nameless because I found out at the dinner that people aren't supposed to know who the six laymen actually are. Uh, I knew, of course, that this friend of mine who invited me was one of them. I realized um, because he himself had been one of the New Americans once. Uh, the luncheon was set for Friday. The drive out to the hills, or out of the hills to the valley, uh, wasn't at all unrelated to the matter at hand because in this um, renativity of patriotic devotion among the, these New Americans was a kindred renaissance. <clears throat> As nature had slopped over its tender and timid green. Uh, as I drove down the river, however, and as I neared the shimmering golden dome of the capital, my fantasy curled in the oppressive heat, and finally cooked away under the boiling sun and the egg frying and the egg frying asphalt. My shirt was sticking to my back when I turned my car over to the parking lot attendant. Cool, man. In counting your blessings, don't forget the the Daniel Boone's air conditioning system. <laughs> Uh, the lobby was jam-packed. Uh, Julian, ha Julian Harshbar... <clears throat> I can't say it. Julian Harshbarger uh, tells me that about everything is going on. Uh, I came for the New Americans dinner, but suddenly I am invited to an Owens, Illinois luncheon. Um, they say there'll be an announcement of some kind, he tells me. He also tells me to meet 
Tony Klein. Tony's a lawyer from Williamson. Uh, Sam Mallison gets off the elevator. I have no idea who any of these people are. Um, it's, I don't know that it matters. I'm just curious. Okay, stop bouncing. It's not physically bouncing. It's just the the camera deciding that it doesn't know exactly how to resolve. Anyway, let's see. Hmm. I'm not terribly interested in this story at the moment, so I'm going to move on. Um, I, I was curious about, like, the title, because it could have been various different things. Um, old liquor in a new jug. Nothing improves with age like porn liquor and good reading, and both improve when rebottled and served. Okay. But I want, hmm. it said that one of the most popular parts of this paper was the Comstock load, which is um, essentially the part actually written by uh, the editor himself, Jim Comstock. So let's see why it was so popular. Um... Uh, Methodists. A reader brought me a bound set of a magazine called The Ladies' Repository for the year 1867, which turns out to be an organ, not so much for ladies, as it does for Methodists, which isn't exactly the way I mean to say it. Uh, on one page is a chart of Methodist statistics for the conference of the various states, and my eye naturally slithered down the page to West Virginia. And now I can give you some facts about Methodists at the close of the Civil War, which is just another one of the fringe benefits of subscribing for this journal. <clears throat> there were, in that year in West Virginia, 107 traveling preachers. There were 148 local preachers. There were 8,200 members for either the traveling preachers or the local preachers to preach to. And there were 86 church edifices for the members to congregate to hear the traveling or local preachers. The total wealth of all churches and parsonages came to $190,325. Uh, for an analysis with today's growth, check with your nearest bishop. Oh yes, something else. The conference that year met at Moundsville. The bishop then was Kingsley. And another thing that year, 1867, seemed to be the centennial year of the founding of the church, which 100 years ago, all over the country, had but 24 traveling preachers and 4,921 members. Ten years later, there were 20,689. A census taken at the end of every decade, starting with 1796 and going to 1866, showed the following growth in the entire country. Um... You can see them if you want. It starts at 56,664 and increases to 800,327. <clears throat> okay. I definitely see a little bit of his, his wit. It's not like super biting and obvious, but it, it's there. A word to the wise. Ever since March or I have been waiting for the taxpaying public's explosive reaction to a little paragraph which appeared in the Charleston Gazette Mail of that date. The little masterpiece was a quotation from John H. Camp, Administrative Assistant to Attorney General C. Donald Robertson, President of the West Virginia Municipal Association and former mayor of Westover, Mon Monongahela County. Uh, the writer asked Mr. Camp whether or not he thought there should be a State Department of Urban Affairs. Definitely, said Mr. Camp, and added that he thought the killing of President Kennedy's plan for a U.S. Department of Urban Affairs by the House was a blow to the cities. The writer then went on to quote Mr. Camp as saying that most cities don't have enough money to support the kind of government they deserve. Also, statutory provisions hinder the collection uh, to adequate... Er, 
hinder the collection of adequate tax money. Tax money. <clears throat> then he said that many of the 224 municipalities can't afford to hire proper legal counsel and that many aren't informed about the financial advantages available to them if they participate in federal projects. Then he said something rather classic. Many aren't aware of the taxes they can impose. Okay. Uh, let's see. Looking through old newspapers is interesting, but let's let's see what dates we should target. Um, I'm doing a general search. <clears throat> important dates and people. Uh, the important dates in the 1960s. I'm sure we'll get tons of really interesting things, right? Okay, I'm going to start with this. It is, I, I, I will show you what I found uh, real quick <laughs> and we'll see what we can find, um, if we can find issues for some of these dates. Uh, this from PBS, the public broadcasting uh, service. <clears throat> the 60s, moments in time. So they, they have a timeline of important moments in the 60s. So uh, let's see what we got. Because um, we just randomly started with this first paper because it was the first paper. But <clears throat> it's a pretty, you know, normal issue. Um, let's see. We've got December 2nd, 1962, $2 billion wasted. Uh, November 1963, U.S. gets tough. New in office, President Johnson pushes for sticker policies on Vietnam. Ah, okay. It's divided into categories. Also, the card at the beginning of this said 1961. But the first paper was 62. I have I have some 61s in here. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, let's see what I got. July 15th, 61 is sort of is like the first issue I have. Kennedy warns a possible nuclear attack in October of 61. Pop culture. A revolution. Ban the bomb protests. Anti-nuclear activists coordinate worldwide protests against nuclear weapons. I don't know the specific dates of those, but... <clears throat> Let's see what we can find. So it looks like most of the dates that they've got on this timeline are before or after right when I have the start of these newspapers, which is fine. Uh, we'll find something. Um, so what do I have to start? I've got July, mid-July of 61. Um... And so, July of 61 was supposed to be banned the bo bomb protests. <laughs> A lot of this seems to be somewhat local. Ooh. <laughs> I'm just randomly seeing things now, too. 
Let's. Hmm. I'm I'm flipping it over and looking at the Comstock load because that was highlighted as like a highlight of this paper. Um, July 29th, 1961. Stop. It does not like newsprint for some reason. I do not know why. Um, minorities. For some strange reason, we Americans are scared of minorities. While we should consider nothing except the individual, we are scared to death of religious and racial groups. Our politicians are terrified at the idea of casting some slur upon a black person, a Jewish person, a Catholic person, or any handful. Uh, I think we probably could use the historical terms. There we go. Thank you, Lord Portico. <clears throat> Uh, right after Kennedy was nominated, I remember the New York Times had a rather comical head headline. It said, Kennedy hopes for minority vote. And the Republicans laughed at this. They said they hoped he did too. I guess a man running for office feels that the combined voting minorities can beat the majority. I rather have the idea that all minority groups will find their place of respect if and when they deserve it. I know we used to worry about the Irish in this country, and there was great to do when they were made fun of on the stage and in the humor magazines. Nobody ever makes fun of the Irish now. Really? I seem to think... There, I, people still made fun of the Irish in the 1960s. <clears throat> Maybe not the way he was thinking, but anyway. Um, one of them, a girl from Philadelphia, is now a queen, isn't she? The Italians used to be called WAPs and looked down upon. I did not know that that was a term. I had heard the term. I did not know it referred to Italians. But yeah. Um, historical documents. Uh, hi, Iron Trout. Uh, let's see. The Italians used to be called that and looked down upon, but the second generation fixed all of that by becoming good Americans, and now nobody ever discriminates against an Italian, except maybe to give the first I too much I, saying I Italian. <clears throat> when I was a kid, Catholics were new and few in my town. And we had some strange ideas about their alleged torture chambers, dungeons, and priests' harems. Uh, if there was any vestige of this silliness, the recent election has put a quietus on it. I don't know anything about discrimination against Jewish people any more than I have than what I have read. My town has one family. As civic builders and do-gooders, this family definitely has a high place among the assets uh, on the town's civic statement. They did it themselves. The town didn't say, there. there's a family of Jewish people, let's not be bigoted, let's show them how tolerant we are. We didn't know there was a difference until a movie called Gentleman's Agreement came to town. That implied they weren't good Americans. I know. Yes. Yes, Hannah, indeed it did. The, the, um... This part. Uh, second generation fixed all that by becoming good Americans and, and now nobody ever discriminates against them. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> we, we don't need to just flood the chat with historical terms over and over and over again. Um, I was, I was caught by like the start, the first sentence of this article was for some strange reason, we Americans are scared of minorities. And I was like, I need to see what the rest of this article says. Um, <clears throat> oh dear. Uh, and that's the black person's job to prove himself essential. We can't lift him, that he must do. And he will because the law is now on his side. So let's see, this was July of 61. So this is referring to the civil rights movement. Uh, decency and respect will be bartered in kind only. 
We can't help him with pity, only with sympathy, and with the feeling that he is trying. Freedom is a thing people must fight for, work for, live for. It isn't doled out to people by others. It isn't something that somebody deserves just because he has been born. I'm sorry, what? Freedom isn't something that somebody deserves just because they were born? <laughs> Holy racism, Batman. The past was the worst. Yeah. Yes, Iron Trout. Um, <clears throat> if you can go into a town and tell the section where the black people live from the section where white people live uh, because of the unkempt lawn and ramshackle house of the former, um, then he isn't ready for freedom to be rammed down his throat? Ah, uh, okay. That is, um, wow. I mean, it did, the, the encyclopedia did say that the, the editor uh, had conservative political views and that they were represented in the paper, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this says that, that his argument here is if the part of town where the people that have been living in forced labor and then came out of that and have been fighting for respect isn't as pretty as the rest of town, then they are not ready for freedom? I did not expect it to go, like, that hard into the, the racism. Would like to go back in time to where he could find a time machine and then go to the future. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Oh my god. The, the next sentence... The next paragraph is also... This... This article started off not horrifying and ended very horrifying. It says, the job of the white man is to condition the black man or the black person for equal rights. Uh, it does not say black person. Uh, this can be done by the schools, by the churches, by civic enterprises and institutions. It is his job then to fight, to fight for equality. The best way to do this is to prove himself as essential to his community betterment as the whites. That isn't too difficult a job. Yes, this is impressive. This is horrifically impressive. <clears throat> I'm always amazed that people not only can think like this, but felt safe publishing about it. Yeah, I, and this was, um, as noted in the Encyclopedia of West Virginia, <laughs> this was possibly the most popular newspaper in West Virginia, um, as well as for people who had left West Virginia but were born there. And it w had a distribution to 40 U.S. states and six non-U.S. countries. <laughs> yeah. Um, using the word hillbilly is the least of the problems here. But what's funny, Portico, is, like, you can type hillbilly in the chat. It's not going to, I don't think it's going to yell at you. Um, Twitch would not let me use the word hillbilly in the title or the go live announcement. I 
Wow. Yeah, I was looking for, like, I, I, I was trying to find interesting dates or interesting, I did not expect to find what we found. Let's see, I've got some August of 61 here. So we're past the ban the bomb protests, according to this timeline. Mm -hmm. I don't think we get as far as 69, so I don't think we'll find anything on the Stonewall riots, but... Ooh! Okay. I'm really curious. Uh... I have to see. I have to see if we have beginning of September 1966. I'm just gonna check. Can any of you guess why? What happened in early September 1966 that this community might find interesting? Come on. It looks like we only have through 64. So we will not be finding an article about the debut of Star Trek. <clears throat> I tried. I, I did try. Uh, all right. Who's got a date in the 60s they want me to look for? May, October. October 6th, 1961. Possibly. Um, also, if you see a headline and you're like, what is that? Feel free to say, Feel free to ask me for a closer look. Because we have a couple of years worth of this paper, and so I'm interested to see what we run across, but I also just... Like I said, I know nothing about it. I saw the title on some boxes and was like, I'm curious about what that is. Um, square eggs. <clears throat> September twenty third, nineteen sixty one. In the same location in the paper where we found the quite horrifying article a few moments ago. This one uh, starts off, square eggs. It is often said, and no doubt often true, that minds of great men run in the same channels. And that being true, it might be equally true that minds of editors often run in the same gutter. And going on from there, it might be true that editors have a special premonition of what is coming. For instance, Jim Gilman of Salisbury, North Carolina, a reader of this journal, writes to accuse me of a special kind of omniscience. Com quote, concerning your comments in the Comstock load, September 2nd, 61, you either had advance notice of what is going on in the North Carolina egg world, or else have a high ESP, unquote. <clears throat> He adds, quote, give my best to Hugh McPherson, 
the next time you see him, unquote. I don't know what there is about Hugh that brings him to mind at the thought of square eggs, but that's part of the letter. So, Hugh, Jim's best. I certainly get a lot of odd chores on this paper. <clears throat> Mr. Gilman shows what he meant by enclosing a clipping datelined Raleigh, North Carolina, and with associated press parentage. The clipping says, So you never heard of eggs shaped like ice cubes? Neither had poultry scientists at North Carolina State College until they set out to assist in promoting North Carolina as the good egg state. At a breakfast here Friday, Governor Terry Sanford will be presented with a supply of the eggs shaped like a child's building blocks at the breakfast. The governor will designate North Carolina officially as the good egg state. Is North Carolina still the good egg state? Hmm. I have never heard of this. But things like that, people don't necessarily know. Their marketing campaigns, like Virginia is for lovers. <clears throat> Dr. Henry W. Guerin of the college's poultry science department told how the cube-shaped eggs are produced. First, a cube-shaped template or form of calcium was prepared, and the egg, minus its regular shell, was placed inside. The template was then inserted into the oviduct of a hen who obligingly deposited eggshell around it. She'll put a shell around anything, explained Dr. Guerin. Then the scientists have to remove the cube-shaped egg because the hen can't lay it properly. This sounds like cruelty to animals. Dr. Guerin doesn't believe square eggs will replace the standard variety anytime soon, although more convenient for packing and storing. They aren't nearly as strong as the regular eggs. And they're rather uncomfortable for the hens. I assumed this was going to be cube hard-boiled eggs, not animal cruelty. Oh, I'm not surprised at where it went. I just... Wow. Totally, totally on brand for the 1960s, though. Especially the early 60s. making hens suffer so that you can get square-shaped eggs. <clears throat> what was I going for? October 6th. Well, this is October 7th. So according to the timeline, on October 6th, 1961, uh, Kennedy warned of a possible nuclear attack advising citizens to be ready for nuclear attack and build family bomb shelters. So this issue was the day after that announcement. Uh, October 7th, 1961. It, it sort of feels like we're in that time period where the, the like narrative of the video game Fallout is, is like about to start, like they're gonna start building vaults. Uh, <clears throat> a bundle, no bigger than a minute, but a Kennedy could be in it. Well, maybe not, pres not president with a name like Donna, but great things can come from a might uh, of humanity that tips the scales at a fraction over two pounds. Okay, so this first article, it is the right sort of time, yeah. So this first article is, not related to the nuclear announcement. It's about a baby. Um, it said Kennedy, so I was like, maybe it'll have something to do with it. It did. Uh, the Trail of the Dead. Yeah, that's more of the ongoing, like, it has uh, serial stories we discovered. Oh, and then, um, yes, page three. Page three is reporting the news from a hundred years before during the American Civil War. 
sensational sexism, Batman. The past was the worst. Yes. <laughs> Civil War fashion plate. This is what the well-dressed Union soldier will be wearing. Because, of course, the whole reason there is a West Virginia is because they seceded from Virginia because Virginia seceded from the United States. So West Virginia was on the Union side in uh, the American Civil War. That's not what page three represents to a Brit. <laughs> <clears throat> What does page three represent to a Brit? I'm I'm apparently missing something. So full dress for a sergeant major in the artillery, a great coat. All the mounted men wear great coats. Full dress for corporal cavalry. Full dress for a captain in the artillery. Undress. For a lieutenant general and fatigue for a private in the infantry. There's the humor. Full dress, great coat, full dress, full dress, undress, fatigue. Not fatigues and the last two are jokes. One of our most popular papers, page three, is a barely dressed woman. Oh. I did not know this, and I'm wondering if that influenced the um, <clears throat> Viner notes for the Monty Python Instant CD collection. It had scantily clad women a few times throughout it, but it also did things like page six was literally just the words page six really big um, <clears throat> because it was Monty Python and Monty Python is, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is so far just all very specifically, West Virginia doesn't... I know it's supposed to include, like, political stuff, but maybe this wasn't a big enough event to be reported in this paper. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, this one seems possibly of interest. What is a hillbilly by J. Franklin Comstock, publisher of the West Virginia Hillbilly. <clears throat> this seems like something worth looking at. A hillbilly is someone who can't look out his window without seeing the big hills and feeling small and big at the same time because of them. He's somebody with a heritage of independence his hillfolk family gave him because, cut off from other people by the mountains, they had to make it by themselves. Someone stubborn and tenacious because he's learned that while faith can move a mountain, it might take a little time. He's friendly because mountains teach that there are more important things to fight than people, and that if your closest friends are both, are both sides of a mountain distant, they're better... They're better held on to than fought with. And he's industrious. Even living lazy in mountain country can work a man pretty hard. <clears throat> he's somebody who knows that only God can make a tree and figures that if he troubled to make a whole state of forested mountains, that state must be specially blessed. <clears throat> a West Virginia hillbilly is a man with wealth underfoot wealth towering over his head, and only the beauty all around him coming easy. 
he has his troubles, but plenty of toughness and faith to stick it out, sometimes looking poorer than he feels until it's time. Now it's time. I've been told I should change the name of my paper, The Hillbilly. Somebody quoted me Webster's definition of that awful word. Well, I'm a hillbilly, and I told him, let Webster change his definition. The only kind of person I know in West Virginia who apologizes now for being a hillbilly is the fellow who isn't sure but what he is one in Webster's sense. We're losing some people from our hills to the flatlands of other states. All right, this may be the way of our country. The good ones want to come back and will, better experienced and trained than ever. We've lost and gained people for years and gained on every trade. <clears throat> and have you noticed those who come here are as proud as the most deep-rooted of us to be known as hillbillies? I had a poll about changing the name of the hillbilly, including native and new West Virginians, school teachers, doctors, lawyers, technical men. The vote was 30 to 1 to retain the name. People like this are changing the old definition so fast that those who bristle at the word are dwindling in number, and that's good. This state has got some doing to get done, and how, how well we do it depends on our opinion of ourselves. No one is going to respect the hillbilly more than we do. Stubborn hillbillies tended and tamed these mountains <laughs> with patience and faith, waiting for the time. Now is the time. Now we're getting the roads. We've got the technology to reap the rewards of our waiting. We're developing our tourist attractions, our cultural potentials, magnets to bring people to, to us to find out about the hillbilly of today to prove Webster old-fashioned. Why not give that stubborn, tenacious, independent hillbilly the real backbone of us, of all of us, <clears throat> credit for what he laid the foundation of? Let's hope we have the guts to live up to him, facing the wonderful, favorable odds his grit preserved for us. Take away his name and you take away the credit from him. Somebody asked George Washington what he'd do if it looked as if he were losing the war. He said, give me but a banner to plant upon the mountain of West Augusta, their name for this area in Washington's day and I will gather around me the men who will lift our bleeding country from the dust and set her free. He knew his hillbillies. Finally, something that was not completely reprehensible that we read in this paper. I'm sorry. Uh, like, that was actually, like, kind of a nice little justification of, you know, why, why this term and why he wasn't interesting to, interested in changing the name. <clears throat> I don't honestly know why we have this paper. There's not a finding aid for this collection. Like it was clearly donated to us by someone, but I don't honestly have any idea why we have it. Hi, Triamis. How are you today? <clears throat> See what we get. What do we have? Churches. So I'm not sure I think this might be poetry. This is a, a section that was in previous issues as well. Old liquor in a new jug. Nothing improves with age like corn liquor and good reading and both improve when rebottled and served. I haven't actually read one of them though. So I don't know if these are stories. What? Is this creative writing? Let's let's read and see. Like this first thing here seems like it's a poem, but okay. <clears throat> they don't seem like they're original. 
All right, I'm going to go for the grammatical enigma from the Sydney Gazette and the New, New South Wales Advertiser submitted by TTA Huntington. <clears throat> from that to which both tense and mood belong, choose the first letter and you can't be wrong. An article indefinite then take, which for a vowel should true English make. Next to the pronoun neuter, give a place of number singular and of objective case. From many an adverb you may sometimes meet, cull the last letter and the work's complete. But as no risk accompanies the trouble, your best reward will be an empty bubble. NBA reply to the above is specifically solicited by a junior correspondent. So it's a riddle. <clears throat> is anybody uh, quick thinking? I do have an an the answer. I can see the answer. So um, from that to which both tense and mood belong, choose the first letter and you can't be wrong. An article indefinite then take, which for a vowel should true English make. Next to the pronoun neuter give a place of number singular and the objective case. From many an adverb you may sometimes meet, call the last letter and the work's complete. But as no risk accompanies the trouble, your best reward will be an empty bubble. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm not that good. A reply soon came. Answer. <clears throat> to the enigma by a junior correspondent. No grammar have I, but to puzzle my brain, I strove your enigma to solve. I read and, constra uh, I read and constrained it again and again, and long did the question revolve. I toiled to no purpose, thrice gave the job o'er still poised by a relic of sanity when accident happily opened a door just closing the picture of vanity <clears throat> i have no idea how you get vanity from the clues that were given <clears throat> i also have no idea why pretzel rocks is once again giving us lyrics. <clears throat> I specifically have it set for no lyrics. I do not know what is happening. Anyway, yeah, I have no idea how you get vanity from these clues. <laughs> I'm not going to puzzle on it. Well, there didn't seem to be a mention of Kennedy's warning about potential nuclear stuff. Let me see what the next, like, big date I should look for is. Well, there's the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 62. There's, of course, November of 63. <laughs> Hi, Shadows of Life. 
I'm gonna. I, we should have it in the in the dates that are here. So I'm gonna poke around and see. Sorry about the bouncing. Here. This is me attempting to. Uh, th these boxes are just big and full of things. Um, June second of sixty two. See if I can put it back. That goes to April. May. Ah, it was on top. It belongs at the very bottom of this box. <clears throat> All right, so this starts in 61, and if I want November of 63, I'm guessing third box. Yep. Yes, indeed. These are um, just slightly cumbersome to move around. <laughs> I fed that riddle to ChatGPT and it thought the answer should be a lie. It's entirely possible that it, uh, Triamis, it's entirely possible that ChatGPT might be correct and that the answer um, is not actually the answer. <clears throat> July. All right. Seven totally clothed streaks through the archives. Not running, just walking fast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shadows. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> huh. Wow. Okay. I I'm going to pull just the back end of this out uh, so we can glance because um <clears throat> November 1963 uh I'll just say for anyone who needs it <clears throat> this date uh will be the, the um assassination of John F Kennedy so if anybody has a need to step away just want to let you know that that is where where we're headed with the papers um <clears throat> all right so this is november 16th so that's just before um the assassination happened on november 22nd and this paper is dated november 23rd 1963. <clears throat> it is not on the front page, which does not surprise me. Because uh, I imagine this paper was actually finalized. Like, this was a weekly paper, so it was finalized earlier. Uh, and there probably was not time to put anything into this issue. Given the racism, it would be interesting to see if it had anything to say about the assassination of um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, that is true. What I don't know the date on that one. RFK was June of 68. <clears throat> I don't know dates. I have to look them up. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, it was in 68, so it would be interesting, but I don't have that issue. Yeah, because we only have through 64. The paper was definitely in publication. I just don't, I don't have issues that new. Um, there was another thing that I was thinking of. Yeah, that's 69. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking to look for like some of the space stuff, but the Apollo missions are too late. Possibly Mercury? Uh, Project Mercury. It's gonna be too early. Oh! So, uh, Project Mercury ran through 63, so it's possible that there might be something. In what we have. Uh, <clears throat> Glenn's orbit was February of 62, so I could look for that and see. <laughs> I, could, I don't know. I'm just looking for dates that might be represented, because it is the 60s, but sadly, I only have from 61 to 64. So... <clears throat> So yeah, my guess is that this paper, being a weekly paper, was already prepped before the events of the 22nd of November, uh, which is why it's not mentioned. <clears throat> but the following issue of the West Virginia Hillbilly from November 30th of 1963. Front page has information about a Finnish exchange student, Mary Lisa Kakuri, that must have been pretty rare in 63. Um, on this one? Talk of the Hills. <clears throat> Good eye, Triamis. We'll look at it. Yeah, Sputnik Sputnik was 50s. I think I think the Mercury program is the only like John Glenn is probably the only possibly Yuri Gagarin on the Vostok 1 in April of 61. I th we should have that issue as well whether or not it will even get mentioned. I don't know. Let's see. Um, the Parkersburg High School Journal last week had a story of student uh, Mary Lisa Kikuri, exchange student, as the heroine of a story headlined Swaps Dancing for Crutch and Wheelchair. <clears throat> well, that's not a great headline. I'm curious where this is going to go, uh, which was real illustrated by an x-ray print of the gal's injured foot. Uh, a reader, Peggy Large of Fayetteville, needs info. I came across a name, Frank Blevins, head of one of the hillbilly bands. I wonder if he could be the son of my... I'm very confused... Wait, is this? Uh, 
Oh, no, that's that's literally it. That's all it mentions. Uh, Triamis. <clears throat> the entirety of the the item about uh, Mary Lisa is that the high school's paper had an article about her uh, as the heroine of a story headlined swaps dancing for crutch and wheelchair. And a photo of an x-ray of her foot. And then the ellipsis here is actually changing to another, like, item. <laughs> um, so we could go and uh if if you like were interested in pursuing more about her it would be you'd be looking for the west parkersburg west virginia high school journal from the same time period to to see more about that but that's a good catch like yeah i i don't know I don't know how prevalent, like, exchange students definitely feel like 50s, 60s, like, they definitely happened, but I don't know how common it was. <clears throat> All right, so November 30, 1963. This is the one that actually was put together after the assassination of Kennedy. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the front page. Jackie, West Virginia is sorry we weep with you. Um, let's see. A flying word from here and there had sowed the name at which we sneered, but soon the name was everywhere, to be reviled and then revered. A presence to be loved and feared, we cannot hide it or deny that we, the gentlemen who jeered, may be forgotten by and by. He came when days were perilous and hearts of men were sore beguiled. And ha having made his note of us, he pondered and was reconciled. Was ever master yet so mild as he and so untamable? We doubted even when he smiled, not knowing what he knew so well. Hmm. He knew that undeceiving fate would shame us whom he served unsought, he knew that he must wince and wait the jest of those for whom he fought. He knew devoutly that he knew devoutly what he thought of us and of our ridicule. He knew that we must all be taught like little children in a school. We gave a glamour to the task that he encountered and saw through, but little of us did he ask, and little did we ever do. And what appears if we review the season when we railed and chafed? It is the face of one who knew that we were learning while we laughed. <clears throat> you just checked and you're pretty sure that the woman on the front page news seems to be an emeritus professor at perhaps the most prestigious university in Finland. Interesting. That would be fascinating. The race that in our vision feels, again the venom that we flung, transfigured to the world reveals the vigilance to which we clung. Shrewd, hallowed, harassed, and among the mysteries that are untold, the face we see was never young, nor could it wholly have been old. For he to whom we had applied our shopman's test of age and worth was elemental when he died, and he was ancient at his birth, the saddest among kings of earth, 
uh, bowed with a galling crown, this man met rancor with a cryptic mirth, laconic and Olympian. The love, the grandeur, and the fame are bound by the world alone. The calm, the smoldering, and the flame of awful patience were his own. With him they are forever flown, past all our fond self-shadowings, wherewith we cumber the unknown, as with inept I uh, Icarian wings. For we were not as other men, twas ours to soar and his to see, but we are coming down again, and we shall come down pleasantly. Nor shall we longer disagree on what it is to be sublime, but flourish in our pedigree and have one titan at a time. <clears throat> I mean, for a paper whose editor was, uh, had some pretty not great conservative views um he definitely uh put together a moving um front page of course includes the civil war thing so far i'm not seeing any other stuff about the assassination um, but we'll see. Hmm. Um. Yeah, so far, it's just the cover, which is fine. <clears throat> like, it doesn't seem like national politics were a huge focus of this paper. It seems like much more local, um, which is fine. See what the, oh, here we go. So the Comstock load. Essentially, the the musings of the um, the author, which we definitely encountered some not great things in before. <clears throat> uh, our lost leader. It was lilacs last in the dooryard blooming, and it was our captain lying on the deck, cold and dead. But more than that, and more than anything, in the annals of literature that marked the wantonly and untimely going of a leader. It wasn't Whitman who knew the martyred Lincoln, but Edwin Arlington Robinson, who, though not knowing, but barely missing him and his time, wrote the master in tribute to the dead president. It says so well our loss that we have chosen it for our front page. It could almost have been written for either, as the man and times do indeed parallel. <clears throat> so the poem that was on the front page uh, is called The Master and is by Edwin Arlington Robinson. <clears throat> Death in the Family. Last Friday, um, a man down in Texas took aim and fired at a moving target 100 yards or so away, and Willis Dorsey heard about it. And he called his landlady, Mrs. Romy Hanna, on the phone, and she came in and told our printer, Dave, David Cook, uh, when I saw him fiddling with the knobs of the television set, I put down the galley proof I was reading and went over and asked what had happened, because we just keep the television set in the shop to see the morning show and to keep up uh, with emergency news of national or state importance. <clears throat> he said that Mrs. Hannah had told him that Willis Dorsey told her that President Kennedy had been shot. The television set is perched high on a kind of shelf over one of the littered comp composing tables, and he had to be careful as he turned the knobs. Soon there was a picture and then some words, and we knew 
that there was unhappily something to the story because there wasn't anything else but the familiar faces of news reporters on any of the channels. I heard the voice say something about the shooting and about not knowing how bad somebody was injured, only he was shot in the head. I simply hoped it was somebody else and that Mrs. Hannah had heard wrong, but it wasn't long until I knew that it was the president of the United States and that the governor of Texas was also shot. Nobody knew how bad. By now, Elizabeth and Helen stopped their machines and stood looking up at the set. George and Curtis stopped what they were doing. Carolyn came in from the office. I picked up the phone to call my wife, but Bronson was on. Uh, he was talking to Jim Campbell of Hope Natural Gas, for whom uh, we were working on a special issue of the paper. Uh, Jim, though, in Clarksburg hadn't heard about it and was somewhat disturbed by the news, but went ahead and finished whatever it was he had to tell Bronson. I went out into the street first because I just couldn't do nothing, and second, I knew a reporter worth his salt at all would at least be out at a time like this to see how people were responding. I passed the taxi driver who was reading in his cab and who, I was sure, hadn't got the news yet. I saw the mayor standing in front of uh, Patsy's pool room, talking with Lon Carter. <clears throat> I asked the mayor if he had heard the news. He didn't answer. Instead, Lon finished a sentence he was on. Well, he can't live. That's all there is to it. He's shot through the head. I went into... Uh, Prelatz's restaurant and ordered a coffee. Reverend Moore, the new Methodist minister, was there. I asked him if he had heard the, the news. He smiled as if there was some kind of joke coming and waited. I told him and then had to tell him several more times. He sat there dazed. I hope it isn't something racial, he muttered. He went out without finishing his coffee. A fellow I didn't know left his booth and came over and whispered to me, Did I hear you say somebody was shot? he faltered. Kennedy? <clears throat> I told him yes. He didn't say anything more. He went to his booth and sat down, and then he got up and left. Elsie Prelotz, Stanley, the uh, proprietress, came in with a huge smile. Something had happened that she had to tell me. I don't even remember. Can't make myself remember what she said. <clears throat> when she had finished, I told her that I figured she hadn't heard what had happened. She was still smiling. Uh, when I told her, she thought it was a kind of joke. She waited for me to go on. Some girls in a booth were listening. I could see they believed me, but I could tell they hoped I could turn it into a Kennedy joke, maybe, and erase what they felt in their bones was true. All smiles vanished from Elsie's face. She went into the kitchen, and there, where there had been some laughter and talk, suddenly was silence. As I went up the street, <clears throat> as I went up the street, I stepped in at Dewey Wyatt's television repair shop. Every set in the store was on, and all the channels were speaking the horrible story to various businessmen who had come here for the bulletin, like they went to the BNO station office to get the news in World War I. This is as far as Reverend Moore got. A young girl stood daubing at her eyes. She had been crying. One channel, had the president dead, another wasn't sure. <clears throat> Outside the door, I met uh, Pank Greer. He said, now we'll never know. I knew what that meant. That morning, we had met for six o'clock coffee. I had told him I was for Goldwater because I wanted a contest wherein a liberal and a conservative would be matched. <clears throat> then I would go along with the winner and never worry about the State of the Union anymore. And that was what Pank meant. I told him I was too sick to talk. Me too, Pank said, and went back to his uh, Richwood wholesale duties and I to the shop. <clears throat> On up the street, I heard a man say to another, Well, that was what you wanted, wasn't it? He added a heh heh, but it was weak, showing that he was ashamed of what he had said and tried to turn it into a, into a joke. Not like that stammered the other. I didn't need to stay to know what transpired. Two foes met, and an ancient grudge of politics tried to glow from a spark. And I thought how those who had criticized him much could really mourn him more, because only in the freedom of thinking, speaking, and feeling could there be so terrible a loss. 
I mean, if they couldn't have said what they wanted under him, then his going would not have been so direful a thing. Then I thought how the sorrow of all wasn't a dirge for a president, so much as for a young man, a young husband, a dead father. It is the same feeling we all have when a young coal miner dies and leaves little children and a young wife. The same when young dreams die. <clears throat> David was on the phone when I went in. He hung up. His wife said that Kennedy was dead. She was crying, he said. We turned to the television set. There was no doubt about it. He was dead, and now the talk was of Lyndon Johnson and about his being sworn in soon. I continued to read some proofs. The linotype girls went back to their machines. David put in some corrections. Curtis went to the Ludlow and started picking up the brass mats that would make type. And George pounded a form down. Uh, and George pounded a form down even. <clears throat> Bronson came in with some copy and said he should never have gone there. There was no fun in our back shop. There was a quiet and orderly despair. I went out into the streets again, waiting for a page proof. The streets were almost bare. I returned and tried to phone my wife again. I had been downtown, she explained. I asked her if she, ha if she heard the news about Kennedy. You mean he's dead? I heard he was shot, but I never imagined that. <clears throat> she started crying and I hung up. And the fellows were putting the forms on the press, and it wasn't long until I had the damp proof of a paper that would see many changes in my hands. I got into the car and went home. I proofread with one eye on the television set. There was a break in the power, adding to our feeling of depression. I turned to the radio. I turned to radio, then uh, back to TV. I sat there for two hours or more when the casket was brought into view and the president's wife was helped from the ramp. My wife went into the kitchen. I could hear her weeping. Our daughter called from Ohio. That was her only way of nudging up near us, as she did in the days past when she was hurt. My wife took a dress she had been working on down to our son Jay's daughter, Kelly. Our other daughter called to ask about something, but really to grope and reach out in a fumbling way. I knew then that all over America, and maybe all over the world, people were groping and reaching out to another. There had been an inward power failure, and we were, all of us, so helpless in the dark. And a freezing fear had gripped us, and we needed the warmth of others until day would come and we could have the light of the sun and of a new leader. <clears throat> At 2.15, the flag rippled on the scene to tell the world it was still there, and the announcer signed off. I turned the knob, and the light retreated into an infinitesimal a little square of light, and then it was gone, and the room was very, very dark. Then I pulled the knob on the alarm clock and went to bed. <clears throat> that was actually... Again, a, a really good article. He clearly can write reminds you of September 11th only we were watching Jerry Springer in the shop while prepping for the first test flights of the day when the news cut in when I I would have been one of those people that was doing stuff and hadn't heard yet because uh, it's funny as I, well it's not funny but uh, September 11th um when that happened, I usually listened to, um, I, I was commuting in DC and I usually listened to the local like news station there to get uh, traffic reports. And that morning I had put on a CD of classical music instead and was listening to music instead of listening to the news like I normally would have. And so I didn't know until I actually got to work uh, that anything had happened. <clears throat> uh, 
Let's see. Okay, so that was interesting. Um, <laughs> so weird to me that September 11th was when I learned the World Trade Centers existed. Came home from school to mom following the news as the first tower had just been hit. <clears throat> um, yeah. That one was in, uh, that whole day was just weird because instead of my usual routine, I listened to classical music on the drive to work and then I got to work and um, none of us did work, but I only had dial up internet at home. And so while we didn't have a TV that really got reception, I spent the entire day just nonstop clicking um, <clears throat> refresh on uh, news websites, mostly the Irish Times, because that one was one that um, I was able to get <laughs> and that seemed to uh, be somewhat reliable with the information it was giving. And um, so, yeah, I, we stayed at work, but we didn't work. Um, so... And, and it was weird because uh, I arrived at work and one of the people that sat in the next row of cubes over, her husband worked at the Pentagon. And by the time she got there, it had been hit. And it was <clears throat> the side of the building where her husband worked or her ex-husband worked. Um, and so she was frantic. Uh, she later found that he had been delayed and was just entering the parking garage when it happened and so was his office was destroyed but he was fine um yeah it was a weird day and and i do agree like that article about the kennedy assassination um had a lot of the same feeling that i remember experiencing on september 11th <clears throat> you called your wife right away and had her put you on the list to drive the ambulance for mutual aid, called her back after the second plane and told her, never mind, you'd be standing alert on a couple fighter jets. Kennedy assassination, much like 9-11, would be one of those days that you remember exactly what you were doing when it happened. Yes, it's weird, but yeah. I also, I remember the Challenger as well. <laughs> I did end up actually doing work because we had stayed, I, I worked at a telecommunications startup um, at the time and uh, the phone system in New York was knocked out because the um, a lot of the system infrastructure was on top of the buildings. <clears throat> and so we got uh, the the company I was at was developing some of the first um, gigabit ethernet routers and things like that. And uh, we had a rush order from Quest, I think it was, uh, boxed it up and sent it out uh, so that they could get their network up and running again. But um, that was the only work that we did. And it, we only got it done because a lot of us had stayed in the building so that we could keep following the news. <clears throat> one of the days that you were very glad to not have TV access at home. I, I was the opposite. You did nothing but watch news all day at school. Uh, so I was the opposite because all, like, all I had was print media. I didn't, like, it wasn't like today where the internet was video everywhere. Uh, so I just had print sites. And like I said, most of the U.S. news sites were useless. They were overloaded. So I was going to places like the the Irish Times. The BBC was pretty overloaded, too, which is why I ended up at the Irish Times. And I was going there to find out what was happening. Um, and because when I got home, all I had was PBS. Nothing else came in on the antenna, and I didn't have cable. And I only had dial up at home. So um, it, it was interesting. That was an interesting day. 
nothing like, hey, kids, watch this live video. Boom, fire, fire, fire. Okay, now turn to page 30 in your English books. Yeah. The Space Shuttle Challenger. Uh-huh. 1986. That was... And all... Everybody was tuned in. Everybody. Because there was a teacher on the shuttle. I was in Hawaii. We were moving away from the islands. And I watched it at school. Like, the movers were coming that day. And I remember watching it in school. My mom was surprised I was at school, but thought, thinks maybe it was because they just wanted to get us out of their hair or something. But yeah, it was the first teacher in space, or it's supposed to be. Uh, her, the runner-up, her backup, actually uh, went through a full astronaut training program and went up as a full astronaut later and did the experiments that Krista McAuliffe was supposed to do. <clears throat> CNN was unscrambled that day so that people with cable and satellite could follow the news. Took you over 10 years before you watched any stuff from 9-11 again. Uh, you don't remember from Challenger, probably because you didn't have TV. Yeah. I went to, I was in New York two weeks after September 11th because my best friend at the time um, uh, worked on Broadway. And so she came down about a week after uh, just because there were bomb threats everywhere all the time. And she just had to get out of there for a bit. And then when she went back up, I went up uh, to visit. So I remember like riding the bus into the city and seeing uh, like the floodlights two weeks after the floodlights uh, going up through the still lingering smoke uh, in columns. But anyway, we have reached time, which is why I switched to, to the face. I think it was interesting. I didn't know what to expect. Um, certainly, I, based on the description, I was expecting a little bit more humor than we found. <laughs> so, but I, I thought it was an interesting thing. I'm, I saw a title on the shelf and thought, let's take a look. And um, I, I had an interesting time. <clears throat> I'm sad that we didn't have any 1968. So I couldn't jump to like the debut of Star Trek. Um, next week, <clears throat> next week I have the Mead and Baker Apothecary Ledger. Um, it is a ledger, which initially sounds not super exciting. Uh, and it is a ledger from, but, but it's an, a ledger from Mead and Baker, which was kind of like the biggest apothecary slash drugstore in Richmond, Virginia. During uh, the, the ledger covers the period of time during the American Civil War. So the ledger itself, because it spans such a long period of time, seems to have been a ledger of um, shipments that were going out. Like, it, it isn't like a daily ledger. So it seems like it was orders, like mail orders, that they were sending out. But it covers the entirety of the American Civil War period in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. Um, I think it'll be interesting to look at. So uh, that is next week. Um, and I don't get to do it very often. 
because usually he finishes and raids me. We're going to raid uh, 16-bit Eric because he typically raids this show <clears throat> and because um, he's doing a wonderful thing today, uh, promoting one of his moderators, uh, Pretty Witchery, to help raise funds uh, for... for what she needs. She has a fundraiser going. And so um, we're going to pop on over there and say hi. I'm going to set that up. Um, it's like he is presently playing Witchwood. So trying to actually set it up on both channels, which fun times. So yeah, we'll pop on over there. Thank you all for joining me today. I hope uh, I hope you had an interesting time. I enjoyed learning. And um, hopefully I see you again soon. Until I do, keep exploring history, everybody. <laughs>